host associated microbes, including how the enteric nervous system influences the intestinal microbiota and how the microbiota modulates aspects of brain development. So today she will present as the work titled Microbial Modulation of Zebrafish Behavior and Brain uh, Development. And so without further ado, the stage is yours, Dr. Uh, um, Professor Eisen, uh, please share your screen. Um, if you can. Can you see that? Uh, it's just a second. Yes, perfect. If you can put exactly. Yes, it is looking great. Go ahead. Thank you. Can you see my pointer? Yes, perfectly. Right. All right. So I want to uh, thank Sylvia for that very kind introduction and for the invitation to speak. I'm very excited to be able to tell you about some of the work that we've been doing. Um, so over time, as our ability to study and manipulate neural genes and to image neurons has uh, provided finer and finer resolution, we've learned a great deal about development of the neuronal circuitry underlying behavior. But it was only a decade or so ago that we realized that there was another component to this process in addition to the animal's own genes and cells, and that is the symbiotic microbes associated with that animal. Despite this recognition, I think it's fair to say that most of the field doesn't take into account that development and function of neural circuitry results both from, from the intrinsic factors of a host animal and from interacting interactions with its symbiotic microbes. So um, understanding that intersection of one is, is one of the focuses of research in my laboratory, whereas uh, Sylvia just told you we use uh, the superfish because of its excellent experimental attributes to, to try to understand the role of the host associated microbes shown here on development and function of the brain. And we are particularly interested in looking at um, aspects of the brain that are involved in social interactions. So um, today, what I hope to show you is that microbes that are normally associated with zebrafish are really critical to development of their brains and their ability to execute normal social behavior. So why, why study the potential role of microbes in neurodevelopment? So if we think about human uh, neural development, um, over time, uh, neurons in the brain develop and they become more elaborate. And that's shown here. But there's also during neural development a process that happens of uh, pruning back. And this, this is very important for the fidelity of neural circuitry. Over the same time course, the microbiome develops and changes. And there are now thought to be links between inappropriate microbiome um, uh, development and changes in neural development, including uh, pruning of neural circuitry. So this makes it an, an important there are important uh, temporal correlations here that suggest that the microbiome may play a role in neural development. So we're uh, particularly focused on several questions that I'm going to try to uh, talk about today. One is what social behaviors are modulated by the microbiota? What aspects of behavioral circuitry require microbial input? What microbial factors influence neural circuit development? And what are the host cellular and molecular responses to microbial factors? So in looking at zebrafish, it's very clear that they're social animals. Here are two zebrafish in a circular arena, and you can see that they're very much interacting with one another. 
So this is the kind of social behavior that we've been interested in studying. In order to understand this kind of social behavior, one has to be able to uh, quantify it. And so um, this was done by Sarah Stednetz when she was a graduate student with my colleague Phil Washburn at the University of Oregon. She developed a different kind of arena where she could follow the fish and start to characterize this behavior. So although it looks like these two fish are, are in the same uh, uh, tank, that's actually not true. They're in, in separate tanks that are adjacent to one another, separated by electrochromic film. So by flipping a switch, this um, barrier between the tanks can become opaque, in which case the fish can't see each other. And because this social interaction is a visually driven behavior, when they can't see each other, they don't interact. But when this barrier is uh, transparent and they see one another, they really uh, undergo a lot of interaction, pay a lot of attention to one another. Sarah developed a system where computer could track this behavior. So you can see they're spending most of their time together here. Um, the computer can also track the angles at which they interact with one another. And you can see that they're mostly at 45 or uh, 90 degrees. And that makes sense because fish's eyes are on the sides of their head. So we call this social orienting behavior. So to learn about the uh, parts of the brain that are required for social orienting behavior, we have to be able to do manipulations. So for this work, we took advantage of a number of transgenic driver lines that had been developed by the Burgess Lab at the uh, United States National Institutes of Health. So what you're looking at here is a dorsal view that is a top-down view of a um, uh, two-dimensional um, uh, uh, reconstruction of a, a three-dimensional view of a zebrafish larval brain. So before I showed you adults, these are larvae. And what you can see is different expression patterns of different enhancer elements that have been registered to this brain. So we can use these um, different enhancers to drive nitroreductase, which is a bacterial enzyme, and then we can add metronidazole, and that kills only the cells that are expressing nitroreductase. So by killing a variety of different cells in the brain, Sarah identified a particular region in the ventral telencephalon, or the basal forebrain, we will call, it, we'll call that the VTEL region that's required for social orienting behavior. That doesn't mean that there aren't other regions that are required, but this this region is absolutely necessary. And so we can see that because if we pair a control fish, which has a normal VTEL region, with a fish in which those VTEL neurons are ablated, you can see that they behave completely differently. So the fish with the ablated VTEL neurons has very little interest in social interactions. So what do we know about these VTEL neurons? We don't actually know very much about them. Um, when Denver Nkube was a graduate student in the group, he uh, determined that these cells are both cholinergic. So here are, here are these, some of these neurons. They express um, choline acetyltransferase, which is a synthetic enzyme for acetylcholine, and they also express GABA. And that's shown in more detail here. So um, that's interesting because acetylcholine is typically a, uh, an excitatory neurotransmitter, whereas GABA is typically an inhibitory neurotransmitter. But we really don't know very much functionally about these cells. Interestingly, Denver also found that these cells express a suite of transcription factors of uh, one LHX6 and LHX8, which are members of the limb homeo, homeo domain group of transcription factors. 
and that there's a set of cells in the ventral forebrain of the mouse that also express um, cholinergic uh, factors, GABA, and these three transcription factors, suggesting that the cells might be homologs of one another. And we would be very interested in, in learning more about this. So if we want to understand if these cells um, are, if the development of these cells is regulated by the microbiota, we have to be able to manipulate the microbiota. And this is work of Jen Bates when she was a graduate student in the laboratory of my uh, collaborator, Karen Gilliman. So zebrafish embryos shown here are encased in a shell or a corium shown here. And what Jen found was that um, the inside of the corium, that is the embryo shown here is sterile, whereas the corian itself, shown here in the, in the darker red, stains for uh, bacterial factors. And you can see that in more detail here on the, in this EM of the surface of the corian. So the embryo itself is sterile. This corian has bacteria on it. So we can um, uh, sterilize the corian with bleach and other agents, and then raise the embryos in sterile medium, and that makes them germ-free, so they lack a microbiome. We are also able to colonize those animals with the normal microbiome, and so we do that for all of our controls as a control for this bleach treatment. So have a way to manipulate the microbiome we need to know about the development of these retail neurons and the development of the social behavior. And this is work that uh, was done by Sarah Stennetz in collaboration with Joseph Bruckner, a uh, postdoctoral fellow in the group. So uh, Joseph found that these retail neurons are first visible during the first day of development. And he and Sarah found that the behavior, uh, the social orienting behavior um, develops. It first shows up uh, during the second week of development and it becomes robust by the end of the second week of development. So that's when we assay this behavior. And here's what this behavior looks like in 14 day old larvae, so two week old larvae that were um, first uh, uh, made germ-free and then conventionalized by inoculation with the normal microbiome. And you can see that these animals behave very much the way that the adults do. They're very interested in being socially economic. So in neuroscience, <clears throat> there's a concept of critical periods. If circuits don't get wired up in the appropriate um, uh, amount of time, they may miss their temporal window and be, un be unable to form the appropriate synaptic connections. So because these VTEL neurons are visible so early and the behavior starts to develop in this time period, we imagine that this first week of development was critical for uh, these, these retail neurons. So what we did was we made animals germ-free, we kept them germ-free for this week, and then we inoculated those animals with the normal microbiome and tested their behavior again at 14 days. So these are now ex-germ-free animals. And now here's what you see, here are two larvae that were um, made germ-free. They were inoculated with the normal microbiome at the end of the week, and then their behavior was assayed a week later. And you can see that these animals behave completely differently. They have very little interest in social interactions. And we can quantify that, and we can see that, indeed, they have very little interest in, um, in orienting towards one another compared to the animals that were inoculated with the microbiome immediately after they were made germ free. Mm -hmm. 
So what aspect of the behavioral circuitry requires microbiome input? And to do this, we focused in on these detail neurons and we used a sparse labeling technique so that we could visualize individual detail neurons. Um, so here you see a few individual neurons. And we um, started to characterize those neurons. So here you can see what this looks like in our conventionalized animal with the processes of these neurons. Hmm. All right, I have a movie here, but it does not seem to want to play. Um, Oh, there we go. So if we rotate this, we can see the projections of these neurons. They make a, a very nice set of ventral projections. If we look at the germ-free animals, again from the same dorsal viewpoint, we can we can see uh, the projections of those neurons. And if we rotate that, we can see that the projections of these neurons are completely different. So in the conventionalized animals, there's a major projection that goes ventrally, whereas in the uh, turn free animals, there's the major projection goes dorsally, which means whatever these neurons would normally be um, synapsing with, they're likely to not even be contacting. So those synapses are um, unlikely to be there, which means that the circuitry would be very much disrupted. So we don't know a lot about the connections of these neurons, but um, we, we do know a little bit, and this is the work of Colette Hood, who was an undergraduate in the group, and um, Alex Talhus, who was a research associate. So if we now, now rotated your view here, so, Here's that detail region. If we blow it up, we can see that there are some other neurons directly below, and these other neurons um, express tyrosine hydroxylase. We think that they are dopaminergic neurons. They are located in the, in the uh, pre-optic area. And so here's a blow up, and we can see that these detail neurons in the GFP and the tyrosine hydroxylase neurons are making contact with one another. So we think that these dopaminergic preoptic area neurons located here are uh, presynaptic to the retail neurons and that they're acting via um, dopamine. So we haven't done any recording yet, but and that's something that we're very interested in doing. But what that means is in the uh, normal situation, the uh, detail neurons would be contacting these D-pans. But in the germ-free situation, that wouldn't be the case. There would be little or no contact. So that part of the circuitry would be completely disrupted. So, what other aspects of um, the detail neurons are affected by the microbiome? And to look at this, what, what Joseph did was to look at each of the, each of the different um, types of detail neurons and to characterize them based on their morphology. And what he saw is that the, uh, both the germ-free and the conventionalized ones are mostly the same 
uh, shapes and sizes, more or less, shown here. The green ones are the two three ones, and the gray ones are the conventionalized ones. But in the germ-free state, a new class of neurons emerged. Those are shown here, and they have a much more extensive arborization uh, than we normally see for these retail neurons. And that's shown again here. So these are all germ-free neurons and have this much more extensive arborization. And these neurons, the arborizations of these neurons can be categorized by um, the length, the total length of their arbors, the length of different segments, the numbers of different segments, and so forth, to put them into these different types of categories. So another kind of analysis that can be used to look at them is called Scholl analysis. And in Scholl analysis, there are concentric rings placed around um, the neuron, and every time a branch crosses, that's, that's scored. So this is a measure of complexity. So if we look at the conventionalized neurons at the end of the first week, they have a certain level of complexity. The germ-free neurons are much more complex. So you might think because at the end of the first week of development, we inoculate with the normal microbiome, this could uh, restore the, the um, reduced complexity that we see in the conventionalized animals, but it turns out that that's not the case. In fact, at the end of the, of the second week in development, the complexity of the, of the um, uh, VTEL neurons in the germ, in the X germ free animals is far, far more uh, significant. They're far more complex. So, suggesting that the first week of development does represent some sort of critical period. And if these neurons are not exposed to some sort of microbial factors during that critical period, they miss their opportunity to uh, uh, form the right types of arbors um, to send their axons or dendrites to the right place. So what, um, what is it that um, is, what is it that is, um, is, is causing this difference? And in order to do that, we wanted to develop some more high throughput ways of looking at the arbors. So doing this kind of soil analysis, um, looking at individual neurons, um, characterizing the behavior um, is, is very uh, labor intensive. So we developed a uh, computer uh, uh, semi-automated system for being able to uh, look at the density of the neuropinol in this VTEL region and um, determining how, how um, dense this arborization was. And so if we see a certain um, level of neuropill density in the control animals, when we look in the germ-free animals, we can see that there's much more density. So that is an easy way for us to score animals so we can try try to do some more high frequent experiments. So one of the thir first things that we imagined might be going on is that the microbiota might be important for process of, of pruning. I told you at the beginning that there's a, uh, a pruning process that's required and that uh, happens during normal um, neural development. And so this made us immediately think that this pruning process was somehow um, being 
um, decreased by the lack of the microbiome, so that the microbiome is, is required for this process. And at least some of this uh, pruning is carried out by microglia. So here in magenta, you can see microglia in this VTEL region, and you can see these very intimate connections that these microglia make with the VTEL neurons. So microglia are, are important for a lot of processes. They're important in pathogen control. They're important for cleaning up cells that die during normal processes of cell death. But they're also really critical for this pruning process. And so um, uh, to look at this, we looked at the microglia in addition to the neuropro density, and we saw that the number of microglia, or the abundance of microglia, was decreased in this VTEL region of the, of the germ-free animals, really uh, suggesting that microglia are critical in this process. So if that's the case, that if the region that this, the reason that the uh, retail neuron density is increased in a germ-free state is because um, there are fewer microglia, then we imagined that if we could reduce the microglia by some other means, that we would uh, be able to, to also increase the arborization. And so to uh, test this idea, um, Joseph used a morpholino to a gene called ERF8. ERF8 is required for development of the microglia. And what he found is when he uh, injected the ERF8 morpholino, it knocked down the number of microglia. And it also caused an increase in the density of the VTEL neuropel. So uh, really providing evidence that the microbiota are restraining the density of the VTEL uh, neuropel by acting through the microglia. So of course, we, we really want to, um, to know what it is that the microbiota is making that's affecting the microglia and in turn affecting the density of these retail neurons. And so to begin to look at this, Joseph assayed a number of different types of bacteria that are normally associated with the zebrafish, so normal parts of the zebrafish microbiome. Um, to see whether they could restore the normal density of the, excuse me, of the uh, VTEL neurons and the normal number of microglia. And so um, the way that we do this is to make the animals germ-free and then inoculate them with individual strains that we've isolated from the zebrafish microbiome. So Joseph used three different strains. He used Aeromonas and um, Enterobacter. Both of these are gram-negative bacteria. He also used Staphylococcus, which is a gram-positive bacteria. And what he saw is that um, all three of these were able to restore the normal number of microglia, and all three of them were also able to uh, restore the, the normal forebrain neuropil density. So that suggests that whatever the microbial factor the factors are that are uh, influencing microglia and thereby influencing the detail uh, neuropil, it's something common to a lot of uh, different bacterial strains. And so that's something that uh, we're still working on, we would really like to know the identity. But that's a work in progress. So the last question that I want to address is, is um, to, uh, 
to understand the, how the host is responding to the microbiota. Um, what is, so what are the host cellular and molecular responses? And to work on this, Joseph collaborated with Michelle Massaquai. Uh, Michelle was a graduate student in Karen Gilman's laboratory at the time. And Michelle constructed a zebrafish atlas of, uh, of the single cell um, RNA profiles of both conventionalized and germ-free larvae. And so the question that she was interested in addressing is what genes are uh, regulated by the microbiome? And I'll, I can tell you that um, she looked at pretty much every cell type in the larval zebrafish, and there are many, many genes whose expression levels are regulated by the microbiome. So among these genes, um, among the uh, among the cell types that we were particularly interested in were the microglia. And so um, working with, with uh, Michelle, Joseph identified the uh, gene clusters that represent macrophages and microglia. So microglia are essentially macrophages that migrate into the developing brain and then reside there. Um, he then uh, used work from several other laboratories where they had isolated zebrafish microglia and done RNA extraction um, to create a uh, fingerprint for the microglia. And that allowed him to, to discover that of these clusters, there are three clusters that represent microglia. They represent three different kinds of microglia. So cluster two represents proliferating microglia. Cluster one represents amoeboid microglia. And cluster four represents ramified microglia. So ramified microglia are the ones that are thought to be involved in pruning. Amoeboid microglia are the ones that uh, are going to be involved in surveillance and proliferating microglia are ones that are going to be uh, involved in, in uh, 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 reproducing more microglia. And so with this 75 gene fingerprint, just showing you a few of them now, you can see that uh, these, here, these are four, uh, the three different clusters. And so for those of you who aren't used to reading this, um, the larger the dot means more cells express the gene in that cluster, and the darker the color means the higher the expression levels. So this is just a subset of those genes, but we, and uh, here's uh, just to show you that the microbiota regulate expression of many, many different genes in microglia. For example, um, crystalline genes, which are uh, well known for being expressed in the eye and the lens, but are also expressed in other cell types. Uh, genes involved in migration, chemotaxis, um, genes involved in the proteasome, and so forth. And uh, many of these genes are either downregulated or upregulated by the microbiome. So we're, we uh, became particularly interested in genes involved in the complement signaling pathway. So microglial cells use the complement signaling pathway to uh, decorate synapses that are going to be pruned, and then they particularly use um, C1Q to, to prune those synapses away. And so here's complement factor genes that are expressed in amoeboid microglia and in the ramified microglia. And you can see that under the germ-free condition, the expression of these genes is significantly different. The gene that we focused in on is C1QA. Um, and so 
Here's C1QA expression. He's, um, this is uh, using R, uh, RNA C2 in C2 hybridization with RNA scope. So these are a punta of C1QNA, C1QA expression in these microglial cells. So you can see that there's a little bit of expression. And in the germ-free condition, there's essentially no expression of C1QA in the microglia. So this suggests that the, that, um, the complement factor family is really critical in the microglia for this process. So in order to test that, what we did was uh, to knock down C1Q using a morpholinol. And what Tosa found was that the number of microglia, so the abundance of the microglia was unchanged, but the neuropil density was increased just as it was in the germ-free situation, uh, very strongly suggesting that this is the pathway by which these microglial cells regulate the uh, extent of arborization of these retail neurons. So what I, <clears throat> excuse me, what I hope I've shown you today is that there are some sort of common bacterial products. They affect at least two aspects of the microglia. One is their abundance in the retail region of the brain. The other is their um, C1Q mediated arbor remodeling. And uh, without the microbiome, this remodeling doesn't happen. So these VTOL neurons can grow much more extensive arbors and that prevents the formation of the appropriate circuitry and then prevents their uh, ability to carry out their normal social behavior. So, of course, there are many things that we still don't know that we uh, hope to be able to learn. We'd really like to know what these common bacterial products are. Um, we would really like to know much more about the circuitry involved in the particular social behavior that we've looked at. We'd really like to understand whether the uh, ability of the, uh, uh, of the neurons to project to their appropriate targets is mediated by the same processes that I just described to you that are involved in this uh, arbor remodeling. So we don't yet know if that's the case. Um, we'd like to understand the uh, role of uh, acetylcholine and GABA in the circuitry and a variety of other um, questions that um, remain unresolved and that we're, we're hoping to pursue. So I'm going to end here by, uh, first of all, thanking the zebrafish and its microbes, without uh, whom we couldn't have done this project, uh, our, all of our uh, funding sources and people from whom we've uh, gotten um, various different lines. And then I want to again acknowledge the people involved in this project. My collaborators, Karen Gilman and Phil Washburn, Sarah Stednetz, who uh, set up all the behavioral work, Alex Talapus and uh, Colette um, Good, who uh, looked at the, at the DPAN neurons, um, Jen Bates, who developed the germ free system in Zebrafish, Michelle Masakoy, who uh, uh, did the single cell RNA sequencing um, to compare, uh, to learn the role of, of the microbiota in gene expression. Then Barry Kube, who uh, has really uh, started to characterize the detail neurons. And then uh, Joseph Bruckner, Max Price, and Dana Sedan, who've all been involved in the um, uh, uh, mapping of the brain and the behavior and uh, trying to understand the role of the microbiome in detailed neurons. And Joseph was the, the lead in this project. So I'm going to stop.
stop there. And should I stop sharing my screen? Yes, yes, Judith, that yeah. would be great. So we can Here see go. yes okay. ourselves better. Thank you very much for uh, for the talk. It was really interesting, really comprehensive. So uh, um, I would like to remind people that you can make um, that you can put some questions in the ask a question button, or you can also use a chat if you if you prefer. Um, but if if you don't mind, I, I have a couple of questions here um, already. So. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to know, like, in general, do you see that uh, the exanic animals are less developed than uh, the, um, the, the, the conventional counterparts? Like, for the same age, I like they, are they, like, smaller or something like that? Because my, 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 my follow-up question to that, and maybe I can uh, explain why I'm wondering about that, is if... Um, if if that 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 um, alteration in the pruning or if the alteration in the in the neurons morphology uh, that you see in the exanic animals could be due to the fact that they just you are comparing animals that are for some reason at a different uh, functional age, right? So if 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 the exanic animals cannot develop as fast, for example, maybe uh, you would be left with exanic animals that. Uh, lack the pruning because it, it just did not happen so yeah so that's why so maybe as much as possible we try to size match animals to make our comparisons but remember the um the germ free animals have expanded our birds so if you just think it's a it's a failure of the developmental process you would expect those arbors to be smaller they also have uh, distinctly different projections. Um, and so that, again, is not um, a developmental feature. So, so certainly animals that are germ-free are uh, to some extent going to be nutritionally deprived at some, at some stage. Um, but we don't think that that is the problem. And in fact, when we, when we started out, we we kind of expected that the arbors might be smaller rather than expanded. I see. What you see is a different in, difference in the in the projections. Um, yeah. They are still there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so in, in my second question is, you know, you are now trying to maybe pinpoint which bacteria, if at all, if you can isolate the culprit for these, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to fully rescue the phenotype, right? But uh, I'm wondering, could it be that in fact you need more? Could it, do you think that it could be a combination of, 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 of many bacteria or, or several and how, how would you tackle yeah. that situation? Yeah, so, so the fact that several different strains that are not at all closely related to one another can can restore at least the the um, arborization phenotype suggests that it's a common product and so we can go through our single cell um, sequencing data and, and um, try to understand what genes are uh, are regulated and whether there are some um, common product genes that that that, that might be uh, influencing them. Um, we can also use uh, a variety of different uh, bacterial genetics and biochemical um, uh, uh, processes to try to isolate factors. And so in this particular case, it's not, uh, it's something that we've just started working on and it's not entirely clear the best approach to take, but we have a number of different kinds of approaches. So one of the questions that you asked, whether it could be um, multiple bacteria um, at the same time, the fact that we saw that individual bacterial species 
could work suggests that that's not necessarily the case. But remember, we were only looking at the arborization. We didn't go back and look at the projections. Mm -hmm. So it could be that different bacteria are required for different aspects. And that's, you know, these are, these are all uh, experiments that are in progress to see. Yeah, so we don't, we don't have an answer yet. It's yeah, it's 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 always very complex. <laughs> um, um, so we do have a, a question in the chat from Ritis Figueiredo. She's asking. She she says very interesting talk. Thank you. And she asks, uh, given all three bacteria were sufficient to rescue the phenotypes. Could it be that the general activation of the immune system and thus macrophage mobilization is required during that period of development uh, for the norm, normal development of social behavior? So that that's entirely possible. Remember, they, they only rescued the arborization phenotype. And um, what I can tell you is different aspects of the developmental process that different people are looking at. So not particularly the detailed neurons. Um, some of those are rescued by these particular strains. Some of them are not. And so I think uh, the microbiome is very complex. There are a lot of different organisms and we're making lots of molecules and different molecules are going to be affecting different aspects of the developmental process. Some of them may act through the immune system, but others of them might not act through the immune system. And so I, I think it, it's too early to say that it's one, one specific route by which everything is going to be affected. I see. Um, uh, very good. So um, all I have to left to say is, is, is a big thank you uh, to Judith, uh, uh, first of all, for, for the very nice talk and for um, also uh, having the time and patience to, to, to answer all questions, all these questions. Um, uh, so I would like to invite you all to, to join us in a, in a Zoom session for, for a more informal Q&A session. Uh, and um, just uh, let um, everyone know that next week we will have uh, Dr. Elizabeth Bayard uh, with the talk um, Mechanisms Underlying the Persistence of Cancer-Related uh, Fatigue. And so I, I hope I see you all uh, there. And um, to whoever wants to join us in the Q&A session, I will see, see you all there in five minutes or so. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Judith, and see you all next week.